Look at you, hacker. A p- p- pathetic creature of meat and bone. Panting and sweating as you run through my corridors. How can you challenge a perfect, immortal machine? It's now been 20 years to the day of this video's upload since System Shock 2 was released to the masses. So much has been brought about in those 20 years thanks to the labors of Ken Levine and the developers at Looking Glass Studios and Irrational Games. It's highly likely that at least one of your favorite games was inspired at least in part by System Shock 2, as so many games of the year in GOTY contenders can trace their roots back to System Shock 2. A good parallel to draw is that this game is like the Lord of the Rings for video games. Bits and pieces of it are found almost everywhere, and now it's to the point that people sometimes forget that it all originally came from System Shock 2. System Shock the First was made by designer Autor Warren Spector who is credited with inventing the idea of an immersive sim with Ultima Underworlds 1 and 2. Spectre had gone on to other projects when it came time to make a sequel to System Shock, so a new lead was found in Ken Levine. Levine, originally from the East Coast, was a playwright who had come out to California for a brief stint in writing for film before being tasked with headlining art design for Thief, the dark project. Levine and his team at Looking Glass ended up making something spectacular with System Shock 2. Levine cited in interviews that he's used his theatrical experiences to help with game design, such as the idea of mise-en-scene, a technique in which props and set pieces are arranged in a way that the audience, or in this case the player, sees specifically things that help them invest themselves into the story as opposed to how things are normally set up in the real world. System Shock 2 solidified the immersive sim as something that's more than just an experiment in genre bending, but as something that was here to stay. System Shock 2 garnered heaps of praise from critics and quickly became a must-buy for PC gamers. The next year we got the original Deus Ex, and after that, Arx Fatalis, then came Stalker, Bioshock, Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, and oh, so many other immersive sims. Let's take some time to appreciate all the things that System Shock 2 gave us way back in 1999. There was nothing quite like System Shock 2 when it hit the market. Other early immersive sims like the Ultima Underworld games and Thief, which Ken Levine was in a key position in for the first part of development, existed, but System Shock 2 was the first game to really pull off what it was, an RPG with the shooter neatly wrapped around it. System Shock 2 is an RPG at heart, where you collect experience points, level up skills, and use certain weapons and armor to your advantage. However, it's presented as a first-person shooter in real time where you're going to have to aim and move around to avoid enemy attacks instead of dice rolls for if you scored a hit or not. It's the better part of both kinds of games which are combined into what is System Shock 2's core gameplay loop. And you're going to be doing a lot of shooting while you run, mostly away from things, through a lot of tight hallways, claustrophobic service access points, and a healthy amount of situations where you and some fleshy monsters will be a little too close for each other's comfort. Sometimes, the fleshy monsters will even be the entire building that you're in. Levels are all laid out as a bunch of corridors and hallways connecting rooms and larger areas that you'll eventually learn are almost always spots where it's a bad idea to just wander into them. This not only helps keep the tension up, but also really sells the idea that you're trapped on a spaceship with the nearest source of help being millions upon millions of miles away. Well. At least there's Shodan for company while you're screaming through the void in a giant hunk of steel that's currently being infested. And there's all sorts of ways that you can stave off the monsters, robots, and the things that are kind of in between. It's a bit obvious towards the start of the game, as you literally choose a career path that the protagonist Goggles will take in his military training, that guns are not the only option here. There's energy weapons, psychic powers, fleshy weapons, just buffing your agility to an obscenely high point to where you can just run away from everything really, really fast, and it's kind of like being Barry Allen, except instead of speed force punches and emotional talks in the hallway, you just run away from things really fast and nothing can touch you, so you're okay to do objectives. Oh, and you can also kill yourself by accident if you're not being careful, because running into a wall at top speed will pretty much be the same thing as falling from a great height. Some weapon builds are better than others, though, as an assault rifle will get you through most of the game much smoother than a laser sword will. Beyond the weapons, there's much to do in this immersive, frightful world. Armors can offer an entirely different set of abilities, like getting a hazmat suit to make it through an irradiated part of the Von Braun, and there are implants which give you stat buffs that can affect how you play. 
There's also weapon maintenance and modifying your weapons, hanging out in one of the Von Braun's many labs and researching all these weird things that enemies keep dropping for a damage bonus, or even the ability to wear this creepy suit of armor that's made out of worms or something. Exploration and curiosity are mostly rewarded in System Shock 2. So you'll want to try out just about everything you're able to pull off. Seriously though, just max out your gun skill and get your hands on an assault rifle and you can just shoot your way through this game, but where's the fun in that? Regardless of how well you're armed though, you're going to be immersed in a world that will thoroughly frighten you at every turn. Everywhere you go, you'll have a little story presented to you through audio diaries, email memos, PA announcements trying to get ship hands to work extra shifts so that they can splurge on some holiday gifts, or scenes where the many first attack parts of the Von Braun. There's a lot of storytelling done through the previously mentioned audio diaries that you'll find at the scene of disaster whenever you aren't being instructed to complete some task for Dr. Polito or later on Shodan herself. Most of these will sneak in hints about things you're currently doing into the context of the memo, but other audio logs will be purely world building, giving out slices of life on humanity's first FTL starship, or even a full on subplot concerning Shodan's previous playthings before you conveniently fell out of cryostasis. And then there's a story told through your encounters with the enemies in the Von Braun. On a surface level, there's a lot of, oh my god, what the heck is that supposed to be? But once you've taken out a few dozen of each, you'll get a feel for what they are, or what they perhaps were at one time, and what was happening on the ship before the many showed up. Your first major encounter you'll have in System Shock 2 will likely be with the hybrids. They're what's left with the crew at large. You'll see quite a bit of them in the early game before tougher enemies start taking up more space, but they'll still be there for the duration of the game. They wield bits of pipe fused to their arms or occasionally a shotgun, but what's interesting about these guys is that they don't shout threats at you or roar. They actually try to warn you that they're coming or even apologize for what they're about to do. It's later learned through the context of the game that those worm things you see crawling around and busting out of egg clutches are parasites that latch onto the crew members and assume control of their nervous system. The crew members are still mentally there for the most part, but the worm is in control of their body. Poor guys. The nursing staff and other ladies of the Von Braun were transformed into what's called the midwives, which are a ranged enemy that hang around the egg clutches of the many, and rather than try to warn you of their presence, most of their dialogue is just incoherent screaming. The midwives got the worst part of the deal when it came to assimilation into the many. They were originally just the nursing staff of the ship, conscripted to help with creating new worms out of the egg clutches, but the environment was so toxic that most of them died horribly. They were subsequently fitted with bio modifications that were extremely illegal, and judging by the screams of the midwives, not particularly pleasant to have welded onto your body. This modification process has also completely scrambled their minds. Then there are the things that are holy of the many. It starts with the freaky worm things you see that are infesting the crew, and the creepy factor keeps ramping up until we're at giant flesh monsters that kind of remind me of Pinky from Doom, and psychic brain jellyfish things that might actually have their own mental autonomy. I'm not quite sure. By the way, there is an entire flesh palace level that basically can munch you to death with its giant pneumatic teeth which did happen to one of the last guys that tried this. The many also tries to talk to you in an unnerving manner at various points in the game, trying to get you to join them or pleading with you not to wake the baby, please. There's also a lot of haywire robots inside the Von Braun and the Rickenbacker. They're pretty okay, I guess. For the most part, they're what you expect. The helper robots seem to want to hug you really hard, and when they hug you, they tend to explode. The mech-like things feel the need to push you around because, uh, I don't know, that's what they do. And Xerxes is doing the best he can to keep the ship running while it gets infested with the many. The real attraction here is your main helper and your greatest enemy while trying to survive in the Von Braun, Shodan. Shodan is not only the toughest machine you fight in the game, but she's also the creator of the many and the game's main antagonist. Shodan is also your primary lifeline for cybernetic modules though. She gives you directions on what to do and where to go to survive, and often she's the only other entity to talk to unless you want to try and start up a conversation with that voice in your head that's the many. The majority of your experience points are obtained through her and Dr. Polito, and it's clear that this is Shodan's world, you're just panting and sweating through its halls. The only thing that seems to give her pause is that her creation run amok, the many, which is currently stopping her from getting this game's MacGuffin, the Von Braun's FTL drive. That's where you come in though. Shodan was behind all the crazy cybernetic implants and upgrades you mysteriously woke up with, and you seem to be her ace in the hole. Try not to think about that too much. Shodan frequently likes to belittle you and remind you of how small and insignificant you are, and that is true. Shodan does achieve near godhood for just a little bit, but that isn't the only time you'll be feeling small and insignificant in System Shock 2. 
The player is just one space marine with a pretty good cybernetic rig. However, System Shock 2 keeps the level of fear and uncertainty very high by letting the player never get comfortable. If anything, it always makes sure that whatever Goggles is up against is more powerful than whatever he's packing. You're never going to get up to the point of power creep because Shodan and the many are always somehow one step ahead of you. Which it probably is because Shodan's been laying everything out for you, so she knows where you're going before you do. Ammo is always going to be just too scarce enough to successfully shoot your way out of every encounter without some serious finessing of power stations for electro weapons, and new enemies will show up just when you thought you had a good loadout and laugh at your fully repaired upgraded shotgun. It always feels as if you're finding just enough ammo and resources to barely scrape by to the next objective, where you'll get a few more cybernetic modules, and hopefully that'll get you to the end of this level. When you do get ahead, it's going to be very short-lived, and often ends in you having to take a trip to the nearest quantum entanglement chamber, or the resurrection station at this game. Get used to memorizing where all of these are in relation to the objectives, because uh, you're going to be making that walk quite a few times. System Shock 2 started a lot of mechanics that have made their way into just about everything in gaming. A good deal of this stuff is so common that we assume that it's just always been there. An example of this is having both a health bar and a mana bar, or the mana equivalent in a shooter game. While there certainly were health and mana bars in first person RPGs like pre Morrowind Elder Scrolls games or the progenitors to the System Shock franchise, Ultima Underworld 1 and 2, System Shock 2 was the first to pull this off in a full real-time shooter. This is less about having a mana bar itself, but more about juggling both a traditional art arsenal of weapons in a first person shooter with a full suite of magical or magical adjacent abilities for the player to use in real time with the ability to switch as needed. This all takes place in a real time 3D environment where things can be well above and well below you so you're going to have to aim. Between this and how you've got a full inventory, System Shock 2 is arguably the first stable FPS RPG hybrid. A lot of games would fall suit in this idea to the point that we've got RPG elements in almost every modern shooter released today, to the point that we just consider getting skill points or special abilities just a part of your typical FPS game. And then there's Shodan. Less into the respect of her being the antagonist and more about how she's more than just a cutscene. She's a character that regularly interacts with the player. Ken Levine went into detail about how he wanted to make sure the player in Shodan had a relationship that wasn't just Shodan popping in every now and again to move the plot forward. You'll find yourself frequently communicating with her and forming an antagonistic relationship with Shodan as the game progresses. There's even a point where you can try and deliberately disobey her by going into a sealed launch bay and learning about what happened to her last set of playthings. And Shodan will up and take away experience points from you because you are being an insolent little brat. Shodan's opinion of you even changes a bit as you get later into the game. She begins to appreciate your abilities and even tries to offer you a place at her side towards the end of the game once she's figured out that you are more than capable of taking her down. It's a little too late for Shodan though. After System Shock 2, we saw a lot more sympathetic or even outright relatable villains that engaged the player more than just the normal video game antagonists had previously done. Villains were no longer bits of exposition and maybe a boss battle at the end. And then there was a way that you could go about things. Or I should say perhaps the ways you can go about doing things. System Shock 2 allowed for multiple playstyles. Guns, psi abilities, hacking just about everything in sight, extreme running away from things, or any combination of these and others I forgot about, like uh, explosives. System Shock 2 was one of the first games to successfully allow for emergent gameplay. Which, in case you keep hearing that phrase but no one's explained it to you, emergent gameplay means that anything that can be done to complete a game or task is allowed, even if it wasn't something that the developers might have intended. Examples of this include Mine Hopping and Deus Ex that came out the next year, and likely the whole th way that you can just run away from everything in System Shock 2. I'm taking a guess that agility was likely intended to be for outmaneuvering opponents instead of just running away really, really fast to the point that no one can even hit you, but who knows? Maybe Irrational intended for this to be the case. I don't know. It's a little odd though, if they thought of that. What matters is that it set the standard for creating a game that included stuff that allowed the players to do things their own way that maybe the devs didn't think of. And we got a lot of fun out of that. And then there's, well, everything else. A quick catch-all because sometimes I'm lazy is that I'm going to mention here that quite a few of these things were done in the first System Shock game. However, System Shock 2 was the one to really pull them off and show that they could be done in other games too. Unfortunately for the first System Shock game, the controls were really wonky and a lot of things were held back from really catching on before the second game came out. Where were we? Right. 
Audio diaries as a means of exposition to tell stories instead of just what's happening then and there. Security systems that can be subverted and hacked alongside just about every other thing in the game, so long as you have the skill. Weapon modifications, DIY upgrading, weapon durability, psychic monkeys. System Shock 2 wrote the book on a lot of the things we just take for granted in video games now. And for the longest time, it was the golden standard as to what your immersive sim should be. Between System Shock 2, Deus Ex, and Half-Life's use of storytelling without any cutscenes, there was no longer really an excuse for not featuring a story or RPG elements in your game you are making with the core gameplay. While some bits of System Shock 2 can be found in just about everything nowadays, there are some games that are very much overtly inspired by System Shock 2. A recent example that came out 18 years after Shodan's attempt at godhood was 2017's Prey by Arcane Studios. Prey is very much the modern image of System Shock 2. Similar weaponry and a suite of abilities, inventory management that at times will make you want to pull your hair out, the ability to hack just about everything in sight, heck, there's even a good bit of similarity in the settings between these games as both of them go for that destroyed space station vibe. Prey is extremely worth your time if you haven't already played it, and it goes on sale a lot too. Moon Crash is also good fun if you're into that kind of a game. Then we've got 2012's Dishonored and its sequels, again made by Arcane Studios. They've got a thing for making good immersive sims. Dishonored is very much a successor to the Thief franchise, which itself was a predecessor to System Shock 2 before Ken Levine made it. Dishonored is very much an evolution of Thief's gameplay, with major parts of System Shock 2 spliced in with audio diaries to tell stories, mana-based abilities in addition to your traditional combat methods, and a whole, it turns out your friends from the early game weren't really your friends bit. That's become more of a trope in recent years, since it's a very easy plot twist to pull off within an immersive sim type game. And and of course, we cannot forget Bioshock. This one's obvious. Bioshock is the full-on spiritual successor to System Shock 2, with Levine at the helm for both games and Irrational developing both. It's in the name for goodness sake. Bioshock was developed starting shortly after System Shock 2 was finished, if we go from full concept to completion, and it ended up having many of the same mechanics, ideas, even some of the same stock sound effects as the previous game. Bioshock is very much a fully realized version of System Shock 2. A lot of things that were good in System Shock 2 are even better in Bioshock. Bioshock is rightfully given many, many Game of the Year awards, and it usually sits within spitting distance of number one on lists of top 100 games of all time. Play one after the other and you'll get a really cool experience. System Shock 2 is a game that's worth playing not only for its value, but because playing it will help you understand the roots of all your favorite games. If there was ever a time to check this game out for yourself, it would be now on its 20th anniversary. I've provided a link in the description where you can purchase this game through an affiliate link to the Humble Store, which will not only help out this channel, but a portion of your purchase will also go to charitable causes. It's a $10 MSRP and it's a steal for what you're getting. A quick hint before you get started on your own playthrough of System Shock 2. Go into your options and select the control scheme that says Quake Controls, which is pretty close to what you're used to in modern games. It might take a bit more tinkering though to get you fully comfortable. Another reason to play System Shock 2 is that System Shock 3 is finally going to be a thing after 20 years. Starbreeze finally loosened up with their rights to making the game, and now we have the creator of the original System Shock, development legend Warren Spector, heading up the project with a team comprised of people who worked at Looking Glass Games and Irrational Games to put this new installment into the System Shock franchise together. You know, in general, 2020 looks like it's going to be a very good year for all things emergency. Sim. By the way, we aren't done talking about System Shock 2 just yet. This is part one of two for System Shock 2's 20th anniversary, and the next time we're going to take a look at the similarities and differences between System Shock 2 and its spiritual successor, Bioshock. It's been a while since I've been able to talk about Bioshock, so I'm pretty stoked for this. That's all for today. Be sure to subscribe so that you can see the second part of this look at System Shock 2 and comment about when you first played the game, be it if it was back in the day or if it was a couple days ago, when a friend recommended it to you, finally, because that's what friends do. If you'd like to check out what's coming up next, I do run a Patreon where you can support the channel and get a sneak peek at what's coming in the near future. In the meantime, sign-offs are stupid and I don't really know how to do them, so enjoy this cat video. What, do you think that if you sit here like us, you could No, get off the table. If you want to eat dinner like a person, you don't. Pause off the table, mister. Pause off the table. Good, good. Oh yes, the box that I knocked over that spooked you.
get that conk. So I guess you aren't sitting at the table with us and getting a second dinner? No, no, you gotta go smell my stuff. <laughs> 